Welcome. I'd like the uh, Madam Clerk to call roll. Present. Uh, Chair, Commissioner Frost. Present. Commissioner Jones. Here. Commissioner Liebig. Here. Commissioner Little. Here. And Commissioner Lolo Lee. Lolo Lee. Lolo Lee. Absent. Lolo Lee. Absent. And Desmond's absent. And and just for the record, uh, Commissioner Desmond is also absent. Okay. I think we missed him. Is uh, Commissioner Valenzuela available? Okay. That's okay. Okay. All right. Continue the rule. So you have a quorum. So we have a quorum. And then they're going to read this statement from here down. Okay. This meeting of the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors is Cablecast Live on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on the Comcast Consolidated Communications and AT&T UVerse cable systems. The meeting is closed captioned and is webcast at metro14live.sacccounty.gov. Today's meeting will be repeated Saturday, March 8th at 1 p.m. on Channel 14. The Sacramento Local Agency Formation Commission fosters public engagement during the meeting and encourages public participation, civility, and use of courteous language. The board does not condone the use of profanity, vulgar language, gestures, or other inappropriate behavior, including personal attacks or threats directed towards any meeting participant. Each speaker will be given two minutes to make a public comment and are limited to making one comment per agenda or off agenda item. Please be mindful of the public comment procedures to avoid being interrupted or disconnected while making your comment. To make a comment in person, please fill out a speaker request form and hand it to the clerk's staff. The chairperson will open public comments for each agenda and off agenda item and direct the clerk to call the name of each speaker. When the clerk calls your name, please come to the podium and make your comment. If a speaker is unavailable to make a comment prior to the closing of public comics, comments, the speaker waives their request to speak and the clerk will file the speaker request form in the record. The clerk will manage the timer and allow each speaker two minutes to make a comment. This concludes your announcement. Nope. I'm sorry. All right. She has a couple more I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. To make a public comment by phone, dial 916-875-2500 and follow the prompts to be placed in queue for a specific agenda off agenda item. Clerk staff will transfer each caller into the meeting. You may send written comments by email to boardclerk at sacccounty.gov. Your comment will be routed to the board and filed in the record. Accommodation, if you need an accommodation pursuant to the Americans Disabilities Act or for medical or other reasons, please see clerk staff for assistance or contact the clerk's office at 916-874-5451 or by email at boardclerk at sacccounty.gov. Thank you in advance for your courtesy and understanding of the meeting procedures. Now, okay, with that, let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Thank you and welcome to LAFCO's April 5th meeting. Madam, uh, Madam Clerk. We're moving on to the consent calendar. Consent calendar. Um, Madam Chair, first we're going to call for public comments relating to matters not on the po posted agenda. Oh, okay, thank okay. you, thank you. Are there any public comments relating to matters not on the uh, posted agenda? We do not have any comments. We do not have any comments. Okay, with that, we will move on to uh, section four consent calendar. Okay, item number one is to approve the meeting minutes for March 1st, 2023. So for your consent matters, you have items one through four, and so you'll need to call for a motion uh, in a second to approve the consent matters or ask your board members if they have questions or want to pull any items. Very well. Are there any questions before we uh, make a motion? No, I'll I'll approve make it. the motion to approve the consent as presented. And Do we have I'll a second? second? Thank you. Okay. Uh, Chair Walton? Uh, yes, Chair Walton? Yes. Commissioner Frost? Aye. Commissioner Jones? Aye. Commissioner Liebig? Aye. Commissioner Little? Aye. Okay. 
And your vote is unanimous. With those members, With those members present. Very well. Section five is next. Uh, public hearing items to consider. Okay. Public hearing to consider an, and approve the final budget for fiscal year 2023-24. Madam Chair and Commissioners, um, this item requests for you to consider and approve the proposed budget for fiscal year 2025, or sorry, 2023 24. And um, uh, uh, con uh, and after uh, uh, opening the public hearing, to approve LAFCO resolution uh, LA, LFA, LAFC 2023 04. Or 05, sorry, approving the final budget for fiscal year 23 24, uh, which reflects the Commission's priorities for the fiscal year. And then after that, to direct staff to uh, transmit the final budget in accordance with Government Code 56 381. Uh, as you know, the budget is adopted in a two step process. At the last meeting, you considered the proposed budget uh, and adopted the proposed budget. Um, and in which we're uh, forecasting at about a 3% change and um, operational revenues and expenditures. Um, the total budget for 23-24 will be uh, a million, uh, million 75,866, um, which is approximately $30,000 higher than what it currently is. It reflects um, changes in staffing costs, uh, primarily. Uh, it's driven by that. But you're also gonna be uh, having some operational um, increases just to the result of things that happen. Um, that's a technical term. Um, you know, inflation, uh, some contractual agreements such as the lease are, um, are increased automatically uh, by a certain percentage. Um, the uh, employee expense, I just wanted to highlight once again for you and the audience, the, um, the, there is a, a reorganization of the agency in which LAFCO will be adding a uh, second analyst to the, um, to the office. We are contracting with the clerk of the board to provide clerk services during the meeting. The new analyst will assist uh, your policy analyst and me with the drafting of um, proposals as well as um, providing the MSR reports, which you've indicated is a priority since several agencies need to have their um, municipal service reviews refreshed. Um, in addition, there will be a little bit of money that we'll, um, what we'll also use to contract with consultants to also help out with the MSR effort. Um, just as a friendly reminder, uh, in your draft budget, we do have regular employee expense under employee expense, but because LAFCO contracts with the county for staff purposes, those funds will always appear as a professional services line item in the monthly reports that you receive as part of your packet. So it's here for purposes of clarity uh, in terms of where the employee expenses go. But from an operational standpoint, it will always be under the operational costs under other professional services byline. Um, it's up on the, on, on, the, uh, on the projection, but you also have it as part of your package on attachment uh, A, exhibit A. Um, what the breakdown is on a, on a, on a government, uh, oh, sorry, on a general ledger line item basis. And uh, as you can see, we've consolidated some of the expenses uh, uh, in, in order to just make a little bit more sense after you know, two years of got a better idea of where some expenses get, um, get um, taken out, especially for what are considered, considered um, journal entries from county expenditures of where the expenses go. And so we're better aligning the allocations with where the money gets taken out of so that it makes a little bit more sense on, uh, from your monthly budget reports. Uh, that concludes my budget, and I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have on, uh, on this. All right, any questions from the commissioners? I'll move approval. for approval by Frost Correct. and second by Liebig. Correct. Go ahead and vote. So, yeah. Okay. Um, Madam Clark. Oh, we need to do, yeah. 
Madam Can we just Cook, do a roll call? No, here. Um, oh. Thank you. Thank you. Your vote, perfect. Your vote is unanimous. With those members, okay. with those members present. Okay. okay. And, and just a quick note, uh, Madam Clerk, Madam Council. Um, do, do we need to officially open and close the public hearing on this? We should this, Perhaps, just to make it clear. Yes, that would so. be good for the record, just yeah, to make so. sure that the public comments, um, mm -hmm. there weren't any. Right. So, yeah. so let's kind of, we'll uh, insert if there's any public comments, now's the time. There are no public comments at this time. All right, thank you very thank much. Thank you, just for the record. Very good. All right, item. moving on to uh, item, item six. Item six is discussion on government code 56133E, exemption authorization and whether LAFCO should explore a local policy. Madam Chair and Commissioners, uh, I'm going to explain this as best as I can because it can get technical very quickly. <laughs> um, under government code 56133, uh, no public agency can provide services outside of their service area, their authorized service area, uh, unless it's done so by under contract. And um, the, what the government code specifically states is that the contract uh, must be approved by LAFCO. Just by way of history, uh, between the 1960s and 1980s, it was found that a lot of agencies were bypassing LAFCO approval um, because they would basically provide services by contract. And uh, what the legislature did in, in 1993 was to insert 56-133 that basically specifically said uh, you can't provide services outside your boundaries, and if you do provide services, it has to be under contract, and it has to go to LAFCO for review. Now, there are certain exemptions uh, to, to those provisions, and uh, the exemption is found under 56-133E. And it denotes basically what some of the things that are, that, that are exempted, for example, the transfer of non-potable water, uh, providing of services by agencies that provide the like services. So an example would be a newly formed city. They don't have time to come up with their, with their, um, with a new, with their own police department, and so they contract with the county sheriffs for law enforcement services. Uh, another example that I provide on the staff report would be uh, the instance where uh, two water agencies form interties between their water systems in order to maintain pressure under emergency conditions. Uh, mutual aid by fire departments used to fall under this as well, but they got their own section carved out under 56-134. So, the, so the, the gist of it is that uh, under contracts, there are certain exemptions that provide. What is left unclear under the government code is that um, there's no determination as to who specifically says, hey, this contract is exempt. Um, and so there has been a, a, an effort by some LAFCOs to actually clarify 56-133. It is highly controversial um, among the uh, entities or organizations that are opposed to it is um, the, the California Special Districts Association. They feel that it's better suited for LAFCOs to address it as a part of a local policy. And so the question before you is whether there should be a local policy here. And um, the, the reality is, is that I, I would argue that there, um, there, there certainly is a, a call for it um, by, uh, under the auspices that whenever you're trying to find yourself, whether or not you're exempt from a certain provision, you tend to go to the agency that enforces that provision to say, hey, is this okay? Um, you would have, a, 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 for example, if I believe that I'm under, uh, that, that I have a certain um, exemption for a tax, I would tend to call the IRS and ask, hey, can I, you know, does this qualify? Same thing for a business license, you tend to go to, um, to, to the entities that enforce that provision to go um, to do it. Um, and so, my argument is that you should have a policy. However, um, in fairness to, um, to other entities, uh, especially for CSDA's position, which I tried summarizing as best as I could on the, on the staff report, is that the reality is that um, you know, under the law, you're either exempt or you're not exempt, and it's, it's, it's pretty clear. And so um, entities could self-exempt themselves, and there has been 
there have been plenty of examples statewide where two public agencies decide they're going to enter into a contract and they exempt themselves um, after looking at 56133. Um, the rebuttal to that argument um, is simply that uh, when you have so many agencies just within a county, in this county in and of itself, you've got 64 independent, independent special districts, seven cities, um, I believe uh, seven uh, CSAs, that tends to create a very um, uneven or um, uh, uh, you, you tend to have a situation in which you might have the different application of the law interpreted 70 plus different ways. And under and and that aspect, uh, under that scenario, it's better to have one party that is a neutral arbiter um, decide whether or not an exemption actually applies. That way you have a uniform standard across all, all, um, all different situations that may arise. And the um, uh, other aspect that, that, that I would argue that, that it would be called for is that the um, LAFCO really has no skin in the game as to whether or not a service is provided. It's whether or not it actually makes sense. And given that you are also in determining boundary changes whether or not a particular system is taxed, I don't mean a literal tax, I'm just meaning the terms of provision of service being provided is at an extreme. You need to know how that service is being allocated and under what circumstances. If you have agencies self-exempt, um, you may not be aware that this water agency is providing service to this parcel or to this entity, or you may not be aware that this, that this park and rec department is already uh, at, uh, at its limit within, within its services because you are not aware of those existence. So having LAFCO be a clearinghouse, having LAFCO be a, um, a, a neutral third party being um, a determinant as to whether or not a contract makes sense um, certainly um, allows itself for you to be more aware of how services are being provided to the county, which then factors into other decisions that you may make on other proposals that may not be related to that service. So what LAFCO is, or what let staff is requesting is um, to authorize the um, staff to come up with a, a draft proposal to be brought back at a later date for you to consider. But it would be basically considered in two separate hearings. First one is for you to look at the language to see whether or not it reads how you would prefer seeing to, that it reads. And then it'd be circulated among all the public agencies in the county for the public input or for their, for their comment. And um, then you would take in the input that you receive from these other entities and uh, either amend the, the policy or decide not to adopt it. But certainly, at this point, you can, um, it, you can decide that you know, maybe this is not necessary and this is where the discussion ends. Uh, so the matter before you really is to uh, determine whether this is a direction that, you, that, that you'd like to go or whether you think it needs to go, or you may not decide that it doesn't need to go down that path. Um, but this would be the, the um, opportunity for, to start having that discussion. So that ends my uh, report uh, with the caveat actually, or with the ex exception that the review of the 56133E exemption the way that it was carried out in, um, in my other lives in the other counties was that it was an administrative um, effort. Basically, agencies would, appro would approach staff. Staff would make some kind of determination. If it's particularly controversial, it would be brought to the commission for them to decide. But if it was pretty ministerial, um, it would be decided at the staff level with the commission then being informed at the next meeting that, by the way, these exemptions are granted. So it's not necessarily a more administrative or bureaucratic process, but it, um, but it would, you know, in a sense of all fairness and full disclosure, it would add, a, add an additional layer that agencies would have to go through. Um, but with that, ends my report. Right. Commissioner Frost. Hi, Jose. Thanks for taking my call this afternoon regarding this very agenda item. I, I did have... Um, and my initial thought on this was why add one more layer of, you know, administrative um, overlay, but 
then you explained that there are situations where people self-exempt or you know districts or entities self-exempt and get themselves in trouble and they could be liable for that so this could be a good thing and i um appreciated your comment regarding because i know there's a lot coming at lafco and knowing what's going on out there is is not a bad thing when we're making decisions um i did want to ask though are we uh, are you going to, are you looking, doing a situational analysis uh, or are you uh, actually looking at their contract or both? And if you're looking at, at you know, at their contract, you're looking, what are, you know, I just wanted to make sure I understood. You're, are you just looking, at, uh, reviewing it to see if they are exempt or are you actually looking at the contract to see if there's an issue that you might have with the contract? It, it would be both. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, it, in the cases where a, a, a situation is exempt, it's pretty clear cut. You know, you have two agencies that are providing the exact same service. One is substituting, you know, the, the other for X, Y, and Z services. Anything that's particularly controversial at that point, the recommendation would be you need to present this to the commission for their review and approval. So, um, so it, the, the, the determination, the level of analysis, depending on the situation, may end up being pretty, pretty clear cut. And if it's not clear cut, then, it, then at that point, it would have to, you know, have to go to the next layer, which would be the, for the commission to, to review and approve. So, it, it's a little bit of both, but okay. you know, in cases. Most cases that are exempt, they're pretty easy to call. The one that I, that I reviewed, for example, in a different county was uh, uh, an RCD doing boat inspections for a neighbor CSD uh, for Quagga. You know, that, that was pretty easy to determine. Well, both agencies are, you know, under, under, their, under the public safety code are allowed to, uh, to re, you know, inspect vote, boats. One had the expertise and the staff to do it, the other one didn't. And so that one, it was just a simple uh, one-page letter telling both districts, I reviewed the situation, given, you know, my understanding is this, given, you know, given these facts, you know, it, it provide, you're, you qualify under this exemption and you should be good to go. Do we, uh, you know, assume the liability that they would have assumed if they exempted themselves by making issuing that letter as not, an agency? Not necessarily. If anything, it adds a layer of protection to them that they actually did follow the procedures under the government code. That they that they did go back to ask LAFCO and say, "Hey, mother, may I?" Um, if they don't do it, if they self-exempt, they're actually opening themselves up to more liability because they didn't follow the proper procedure under the, under the, or at least not the proper, but the, the procedure specified under the government code. So we're not as really assuming liability in this point because they came out and they, and they asked. If someone sues, then it becomes part of the administrative record where we, have, we would present our defense saying, hey, you know, this is what we did. Um, and, and again, I think it's perfectly supported by the, by the government code. I imagine there's not that many of these, right? Uh, yes, no. Oh, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff going on. So. Yeah, you know, yeah. we don't. We only know what we know, right? So, if there are other agencies that have decided that they're going to enter into a contract that they're self-exempted, and in fact, one of them was brought to my attention a, a few weeks back. We didn't know the, of their existence until it was brought to our, our existence. If if all agencies know, you have to come before LAFCO. Then we know that we that, that what they are. But if they self-exempt, there's no way to knowing it until you know, years down the line. What about cross-jurisdictional, like um, our police department and the sheriff and uh, Placer County, you know, they all work collaboratively on bomb squad or on drug, um, you know, or whatever. Under a mutual aid scenario? Mutual aid, uh, yeah. No, those that, are definitely clearly 56133 exempt. There, there's no question about those kind of scenarios. Okay, but they would still have to, if we do this policy, they would then have to submit it anyway. Is that correct? Probably if they're entering into a new contract. Any existing okay. contract is already out there, so. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Liebig. Yeah, so I'm thinking like down the road, like 
different scenarios of how this could play out. So say we, you know, policy goes into effect. Could this then, like on a special district perspective, somewhere down the line prompt the commission to look at a, you know, if, if they can see that a, a, a district is not performing their duties and they're contracting all their services out, could that then lead to a potential, you know, forced consolidation or those types of things are kind of put down there if, if you can see that everything's being contracted out and they're not handling, you know, internal business or that type of thing, is that, could this spur kind of a direction that way in kind of that kind of more longer term scenario or is this really meant for short term, you know, workarounds for things that, you know, you, you talked about, like not having the expertise or, you know, what about longstanding contracts if we have actual districts that are putting out services that they should be offering and just not because they're contracting because it makes either more fiscal sense or personnel sense or, or what have you. I'm just thinking, what what is that long term? Are, are there long term potential issues that this could trigger LAFCO to get more involved down the road? Those are interesting scenarios, but um, having an agency contract out all their services per se doesn't necessarily mean that there's a dysfunction or a need to reorganize. Okay. Um, special districts, by law, in essence, are supposed to be providing services under the most efficient, transparent, cost effective manner that they should. Okay. And if contracting out their services and their staffing makes more sense, then the board of directors for that district has a fiduciary duty to do so. Okay. Now, if it ends up being that the district at some point later down the line uh, is unable to contract out or they don't have sufficient services mm -hmm. to live up to their contracts, then, then that would trigger the issue gotcha. of whether okay. there should be consolidation. But just the act of them outsourcing um, some services per se doesn't trigger anything in, okay. in, in, in my eyes. Yeah, so this is then more really to provide, really to keep LAFCO in the loop of what's going on and where inner district or city, you know, contracts are happening to make that sure that we're aware of that versus finding out in an MSR down the road in a, you know, finding in an, you know, appeal of some sort of situation. It's just really keeping this commission abreast of then of what's going on contractually in between agencies and districts. That is certainly a component to it. The other component to it would be that you have the application of the of statute in a consistent and uniform fashion throughout the county. Okay. Having districts do it themselves could basically, you know, would, you would have differing standards mm -hmm. on whether they're exempt or not, whereas LAFCO could be basically the neutral third party that says, well, okay, this applies here, gotcha. and you would use the same standard consistently as okay. you look at all these different contracts. Okay. Thank you. Are there any more comments from the commission? Questions? Y yes, ma'am. I don't know if it, Madam Chair, I don't know if it came up yet. Just came up. All right. Commissioner uh, Jones. Smith. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Th thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner Leibig brings up a good point. However, I think if something is, if there's an issue that that's large, that's large enough and um, concerning enough, we should be able to capture that in the MSR review. That's when something really big will come through. Um, I would very much like to see a, a staff uh, report and we go through these steps uh, because I think for, for future clarity, this will be very, very important. And I, uh, it, it is important for this commission to put forth these types of policies before we need them. That's the key. Put them up before we need them. And uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, Mr. Henriquez can, can hand it out. I also have a, uh, a, a handout here. In 2022, Cal LAFCO issued a white paper on this very issue. And it gives some case studies that, um, you know, if one doesn't have enough reading to do, <laughs> one can look through uh, this uh, white paper and uh, do a little bit more in-depth dive. And it is in support of uh, the uh, LAFCO being in control, not so much control as having that information because something pops up over on the right hand and then something else pops up on the left hand that could conflict. If we don't know about these issues, we're in Dutch because we got to come in and try to clean and, and, and assist with cleaning up the issue. 
So I would be very much in favor of, uh, of uh, having Jose and Desiree do, do some more work. Hey, uh, Commissioner uh, Little. Yeah, I, I would agree that uh, this makes a lot of sense given the number of entities in our county having a consistent policy across the board really makes a lot of sense. And of course, we get more information, we get our staff report, it goes out to, the, to all of the districts and we're gonna, we're gonna see a lot more information as that comes through and then I think we can decide we may have to tweak it a little bit, but at least it gives us, and it puts them on notice once we've put out that um, report that we're asking them for information. I think then they're kind of on notice that, that this is an important thing and that whether one is exempt or not, whether we actually go through with this or not, <laughs> you've kind of put them on notice that they need to be aware of this and not try to um, self-exempt. So I, I think it's a very good thing and I think we should move forward with it. All right. Shall we open it up to uh, public comments? Madam? There are no public comments All right. this time. All right, well, um, so what is the will of the commission? Sounds like we're I'll Move the staff in. recommendation. Mm -hmm. Do we need a motion? I don't think so. Uh, I'll, I'll move second. staff's recommendation, Madam Chair, to uh, initiate uh, a draft policy. Second. Okay, for, for clarification, uh, Jones made the motion a little uh, second. Sure. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and the vote is unanimous by all members present. Okay, number seven. Seven, confirmation of nominees to the Special District Advisory Committee. Madam Chair and Commissioners, um, I'll just make a very brief uh, <laughs> introduction. And then um, um, uh, Commissioner Liebig, who is the chair of the Special District Advisory Committee, um, uh, can, can um, uh, pick it up from there. You have a, a committee of uh, independent special districts who um, uh, who serve to basically provide input to um, to your special district representatives, um, and it's become a, a really good um, forum, both for the exchange of information, but also uh, to provide input in, in terms of some of the things that LAFCO is doing. Uh, right now, you have an opening for Office B, which is a two-year term for this calendar year and next calendar year. And in addition, there were uh, uh, some vacancies in, in Office A, uh, which would be for people to serve and complete the two-year term that started last year. And so um, uh, it was opened up to the special districts to nominate someone on their board to serve and uh, applications are submitted. Your special district representatives, both regular and alternate more, um, reviewed and are submitting these names for your consideration. Yeah, the Special District Advisory Committee was formed many years ago and has really provided a great forum for discussion, talking about issues, sharing um, you know, concerns they have among special districts and really just uh, serving as a collaborative forum for them to really bring together um, issues affecting you know, specifically districts, both large and small across the county. Um, we were very pleased with the number of applications that we received. It actually filled out our entire committee for both Office A, which is ending in December of 23, as well as Office B, which is ending um, in December of 24. We have a wide range of special districts, as you can see in the staff memo, um, ranging from Parks and Rec to Water to um, CSDs, um, as well as SMUD. And so very excited to work with these individuals in the coming year, gain their perspective, um, and really just, again, better inform both myself and Commissioner Jones on issues affecting special districts and how to represent um, those interests best here on this commission. And so um, our you know, recommendation moving forward is to accept these nominees. They're all very qualified individuals representing their individual special districts um, and would be great assets um, in an advisory capacity to um, both myself and Commissioner Jones uh, 
uh, as well as alternate commissioner Moore and um, and this this body in in general. Very good. Any questions from the commission? So, with that, I'll, I'll move to accept um, the staff recommendation. Uh, and I'd be as glad we... to second that motion. <laughs> okay. And should we do public comments so, per se? Okay. So, uh, yes. Madam Clerk, or is there? There are no public comments at okay. this time. Great. And the vote is unanimous by all members present. All right. Item uh, six, number eight. Number eight, creation of an ad hoc committee to study the need for a new Municipal Service Report Review Policy Number 7. Madam Chair, I am happy to turn this over to Desiree Fox, your policy analyst. Good evening, Madam Chair and Commissioners. I'll be presenting this item, and because I'm not as savvy as Mr. Enriquez, <laughs> I have a PowerPoint <laughs> <laughs> to help me stay on track. Okay, just a, a little bit of a background. In RCKH, in the very beginning, it establishes some findings and declarations. Um, it specifically says that in the legislature there are some priorities, and a part of the priorities is that we need to recognize that there are types and levels of services that need to be provided to the county, and there needs to be some analysis to determine what those priorities are. Within CKH, we have our municipal service reviews, which are required to update our sphere of influences, and they're also done um, by staff initiation. And in determining whether an MSR is complete and it's appropriate, we have to do uh, make six determinations, and those are listed on your screen. There is a seven determination that's listed that allows for the, um, a local commission to adopt a policy that will serve the needs and levels of service, services that might be unique to a region. Because as you know, CKH is applied to all the different counties throughout California. But there might be something that a region may need, and it empowers a local, set number seven empowers a local commission to adopt a policy to address that regional need. It specifically says that you can consider any other matter related to effective or efficient service delivery as required by commission policy. Um, as such, staff's recommendation is that our commission establish a committee so that we can develop a regional policy that is applied to our municipal service reviews. And the reason for this recommendation is that, as we've kind of heard today, we're probably going to be doing a lot more MSRs and SOIs. Staff will be expanding, so we'll have the capacity to do more MSR and SOIs. A lot of them are outdated, so they need to be updated, as I'm sure a lot of you know. Um, so kind of hitting the ground running by making sure that we're doing a qualitative overview of what an MSR should look like and making sure that we're kind of being trailblazers in our approach to um, how we how we approach a municipal service review, because there's a lot of power in it. So overall, the benefit of the committee will be that it will improve the efficiency and delivery of municipal services, because that's what an MSR is supposed to do. Um, it allows staff to really meet the intention of CKH and not just kind of go through the, the basic standards, but look at what are the priorities and how can we make sure that we're doing the best that we can and um, implementing the intention of the legislation. And then it will improve the effectiveness of the MSR process. And most importantly, it's going to have a statewide benefit because we'll be trailblazers and people will see Sacramento LAFCO developed a policy that might really put us on the map and show how we're um, having a creative approach to how we implement CKH. So that concludes my introduction on the item, and I can answer any questions if you so have so. Madam Chair, I'd like to add that... Um uh, you, do, you were provided with copies of local policies from other LAFCOs. There are um, more LAFCOs that actually have a local policy on item number seven that were provided. We just, you know, what's in your staff report is a nice, healthy representation of, of, of what's available. Okay. Commissioner Jones. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, uh, again, another uh, point for... Uh, future clarity that we establish policies before we get stuck and have to do it with 2020 hindsight. This is a perfect example. I do have a particular question. Perhaps it was in the staff report, but I, duh. Sometimes the brain waves get uh, uh, aren't as long as they should be. 
Uh, Desiree, how long is our timeline? What, what have you all envisioned for a timeline for this working committee? So we haven't developed a timeline yet. That's what the committee will be for. I believe that the committee can determine um, what that policy might look like. And that timeline might be dependent on the amount of analysis or research we have to do to develop that policy. So we have not created one yet. You did not overlook it. It was not in a staff memo, but we don't have a timeline as of yet, unless I'm wrong. Okay. <laughs> so if one volunteers for this, is this a year or a 10-year term, or what is the, <laughs> what's the penalty for saying yes to this? Um, from experience, it'll probably be like maybe a one or two meeting commitment, um, because probably one of the things that, that staff will do beforehand in preparation of the first meeting of the ad hoc committee will be to really give you a sample of local policies uh, what's out there. Um, I think it's also would warrant going through our policies or the local policies the Sacramento LAFCO does have to identify things that um, the commission may find pertinent and so to kind of provide ideas of some of the policy directions that you can go. Um, so it would probably be a matter of first meeting discussing the you know the what staff has found and then the second meeting, you know, fine tuning what the recommendations of the commission would be mm -hmm. on the proposed policy. And then if the, if the ad hoc committee wants to meet for a third time, they can as well. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that's kind of the way that I would be envisioned in my head. Okay. Uh, well, Madam Chair, uh, I would, uh, uh, I already have a little list going. So I would uh, be glad to be a, a volunteer on this uh, working committee to, to help establish this policy for MSRs. Fantastic. Commissioner Frost? I've been on LAFCO for a while and I don't remember us doing a lot of MSRs and I know when I went to Cal LAFCO conference, uh, that was one of the conversations we had. You know, a lot of agencies don't necessarily do a lot of them and it could be because they're, it's cost prohibitive because a lot goes into an MSR. Um, do you anticipate kind of um, doing more, uh, catching up, uh, you know, what can you, I, I, I don't have any objection to exploring this. I just was curious um, what your intentions were around this. Sure. Uh, you know, the commission has given us direction to basically um, try to refresh as many agencies as possible starting with, with water agencies um, and then moving on to other critical municipal services such as fire um, in the cities. And we do know that even if staff itself is, can be taxed because it's only the two of us, hopefully joined by one other person, um, the reality is that we also have cities that are looking to uh, refresh their MSRs. I've been contacted by three, three cities specifically oh, wow. that want to do their MSRs, yes. Um, and, and so I think right now kind of the, the, the time is, is, is opportune because even if we do it or if we do it by a consultant, or if it's by a consultant, we basically say, hey, look at this additional thing as well. And if we do it, it'd be basically just part of the, part of the process <laughs> of incorporating that into the report. So it's not like we're going to do 15 a year, but you'll, you're going to start seeing a steady stream of these um, refreshed MSRs. Uh, coming down the pike um, in, in the coming years. I know it's a lot of work. Thank you. Can I also add that uh, MSR is required prior to an amendment to a sphere of influence. So there are a few projects that you'll see when we go over our um, application status and time report that show that there are um, current MSR and SOIs that are in. So even if it's not an MSR by itself, if there's someone coming and they need to do a sphere of influence amendment for their project, they would have to come in and do an MSR as well. And I'd like to amend, there's actually been four cities that are approached. <laughs> 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 That's the reason we need more staff. <laughs> <laughs> What is the uh, will of the committee? I, I, uh, Mission. I, I support yeah. um, exploring uh, this, and if no one else wants to be on that committee, I can, but if someone else would like to, I don't have to be. So, Lindsay. Oh, I'm 
If or... I commit to something in the next couple months, my husband might hurt me oh. if I'm having a baby <laughs> next month. So I, <laughs> uh, I, I would be willing to do it. Okay, you go. <laughs> how, how many uh, are you looking for? Up to three. Okay. Yeah. So the chair. If you like to volunteer for that as well, <laughs> right. or Commissioner yes. Frost. Yes. It's it's a good. This, lear, you'll learn more about MSRs too. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Worthwhile. Would love to participate. Just not in this current time frame. <laughs> yeah. okay. okay. Any uh, public comment? No public comments at this time. We'll move approval. Or do we need that? Do we just need? That was a direction, right? Uh, we're okay. We can move on. You're good with direction. That's fine. Okay. Okay. So moving on to uh, number nine. Item nine is announcement of the upcoming special district election for a new term 2023 through 2027. Commissioners, I'll make it very quick. Um, basically, the uh, y your, you have staggered terms for your independent special district representation on the commission. And uh, in this case, uh, Commissioner Liebig's term uh, ends this calendar year. So staff will be making preparations to initiate the next election. Independent special districts elect their representatives from the boards of directors uh, among themselves. And it's a two-step process. First, it's a call for nominations. And then the second, it's an actual election. And it's basically, it's a majority of the, of the districts that vote. Um, and so um, let staff will be sending out letters to the independent special districts, letting them know um, that, that a term is gonna be up. And if they wish to nominate someone, Here's the form that they have to fill out and send it back by a certain date. And then um, after that data ballot is created and it's recirculated back to the districts for them to vote. And so um, that is the gist of my report. Okay. I'm curious if Commissioner Liebig is planning to run again. Is that? Yes. Okay to ask. Yep. Okay. No, I currently still do serve on two special districts, so I will be submitting hopefully for a renewal. Good. All right. Do you need more direction or with this? All right. Item number 10. Number 10 is discussion of the LAFCO projects report. Madam Chair, I am uh, pleased to turn this over to your policy analyst. Okay, um, Madam Chair and Commissioners, you all requested at our February LAFCO Commission meeting that staff provide you with the report of projects that are in our queue. So we have created the Application Status Time Report and Overview Document, otherwise known as the Astro Sheet. <coughs> Clever. <laughs> it will be provided to you in your commission packet every month, but we won't be doing a presentation on it and it won't be accompanied by a staff memo unless staff or the commission finds it necessary. So really quickly, just kind of going over the information provided and if there's any suggestions you all have, if there's more information you all would like to be provided, just let us know. Um, we have broken down projects based off of status and time. So for status, we have anticipated projects and those are projects that are not, have not been submitted to LAFCO yet. We haven't received any application material, but there are conversations happening with our executive officer. And then we have holder pending. So we've received partial application material and we're just waiting on the applicant to um, provide the full set of material so that we can get it going. And then lastly, it's active. Those projects are already been submitted. They've been deemed complete and we're going through the process per our policy and procedures. And in regards to time, we've broken those down into three categories. So we have projects that we have established are taking marginal time, meaning not too much correspondence. We are barely communicating with them because it might be an anticipated project. Then we have projects that are just taking the standard time based off of what a project will require based off of our policy and procedures. And then we have our time consuming projects, which um, are requiring frequent correspondence with agency and districts, um, maybe a lot of meetings throughout the day or meetings outside of work hours and tend to be taking a lot of focus from staff. There's a few projects that we have that are anticipated um, and time consuming and those would be the Del Paso Manor and Sac Suburban Water District Reorg. And then we have our Airport South Industrial Reorganization efforts that 
anticipated, have not received material from them yet, but there have been a lot of communication and coordination to help get the project ready for a local application submittal. Um, things I did not include in this document is the project number or a heavy description of what the project entails. So if you want that information, we can expand the sheet so that it has um, more information. But other than that, that concludes my introduction of the item. Any questions, comments? This, this is fantastic. I think this is great. This gives us a clear outlook on where things are going. I think it clearly aligns with the budget we just passed on why we need increased staffing, where things are at. So just knowing all the projects in queue and where things are at is, is fantastic. So thank you. Anything else before we adjourn? And I would like to add that this, this report is for you. So if you find it that it's lacking on certain things or do you, or do you prefer that some things are, that we provide are not really necessary, it can be customized based upon your preference. So um, it is there and uh, really is just intended to, um, to provide you with the information that you were seeking. So please do not be shy about you know, providing feedback to staff about whether the report serves your needs. All right, one more thing, uh, Commissioner Jones. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Executive Officer uh, Enriquez. I appreciate this very much. Uh, this lets us know the status of what's going on. And I've already harassed staff on a couple issues to say where in the pipeline is this stuff? Is it happening or not, or, or where are we in, the, uh, in this timeline? So I very much appreciate this effort, and uh, I, I will have no qualms about calling either of you if one of these things pop up and I have questions about it. Uh, so thank you very much. And I would like to uh, provide props to your policy analyst. She's the one who came up with the name of Astro Sheet. So <laughs> I really like it being a sci-fi fan myself. So. All right. With that, meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.